Hi, welcome to Exploring Sunday Scriptures for February the 21st, 2023. These are the scriptures that will be used in worship this Sunday, February the 26th, 2023. Our first Sunday in the season of Lent. So Ash Wednesday begins the 40-day season of Lent, that is this Wednesday. And the season of Lent is all of the days comprising the time between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday, excluding Sundays, as Sundays are always considered mini Easter's, so joyous celebrations, and therefore not included in the number of days in the penitential season itself. Season of Lent is the oldest of the liturgical seasons that Christians maintain, a season of preparation often was what uh, the season in which those who converted to the faith or who were new to the faith went through their final period of, of testing, if you will, concluding at the Easter vigil when they were baptized and then brought into the faith community to enjoy their first experience of being at the table, Holy Communion, with the others of the community continues to be a very important season and often is marked off by disciplines taken up for the season, either taking on something or giving up something. Many people use this as an opportunity to, to uh, do away with bad dietary habits or other such things as a way of giving something up for the 40 days of Lent. Some people take on, so additional service or ministry are taken on through this period. If you've never done Feasting on the Word before, which is an opportunity we have on Wednesdays, it takes about 10 minutes, that might be something that you consider taking on as part of the discipline of Lent is throughout the season of Lent to participate in Feasting on the Word each week on Wednesdays. Or maybe it's coming to music and meditation. We won't be holding one this Friday since we have the Ash Wednesday service midweek, but starting next week, we will have music and meditation every Friday. Or maybe it's something more direct in service. And so finding an, an agency or a type of ministry that you might be interested in doing to look how you can volunteer your time or talents with said uh, industry. The first Sunday of Lent, Ash Wednesday always has the same scriptures associated with it. The first Sunday in Lent has very similar readings over the three years of the lectionary, though it depends which gospel they come from. And the main focus, in, particularly of the gospel, is the time of Jesus' temptation or his wilderness experience, which directly followed his baptism. The point of this is twofold. Number one is a period of time that is usually marked off as the amount that Jesus spent in the wilderness of 40 days. So it matches with our 40 days of Lent. Secondly, it has to do with the challenge of being in the wilderness itself and, the, and, and what Jesus faced there. And so similarly, as we go through this time of journeying ourselves, some of the challenges that we can expect to encounter and in seeing in Jesus, having an example, how we might also overcome these obstacles as we encounter them. This being uh, the lectionary year that we're in means that the Gospel of Matthew is where we hear of this story from. Um, so we are back on lectionary for the season of Lent. And the purpose of that is the lectionary really does uh, provide a very solid foundation for the penitential season and ultimately moving us towards Jerusalem and Easter. And so it's a perfect time to come back to the discipline of the lectionary and to journey alongside many other Christians throughout the world in hearing these same passages of scripture within this week. As always, I encourage you to think about the context because now we've talked about the liturgical context or where this sits within the liturgical year. This is the first Sunday of Lent, uh, but also the other context that you think might be influencing the way that you experience or hear these scriptures as we encounter them on this week. So we're now late in February. Perhaps we're really getting anxious or anticipating the spring at this point, dreading any predictions of winter or snow. That certainly is something that is there. Uh, and there could be a whole host of other things. As I've noted in the past, they could be joyful things happening in your life, but they could also be challenges that you or other loved ones might be experiencing, such as health challenges or medical challenges and, and other similar type of things. 
So all of that does influence our encounter with Scripture, and so I think it's important to just take the time to, to really note those so that we can see all of the influences that are at play whenever we are coming to try to encounter God in, in uh, inspired word, in Holy Scripture. Let me get into those scriptures now, and the first of those comes from the book of Genesis, and this is the second chapter. This is the second of the creation stories that we have, or creation myths that we have within Genesis, and this is the one in which we encounter Adam and Eve, which become um, archetypes for all of humanity as well as our um, departure from God and God's the ways. So some people look at this as the entry of sin, um, but our fall from paradise, which is ultimately what is prophesied about, is a return to the peaceable kingdom and the paradise once enjoyed. And I think the teachings and ministry of Jesus, what is laid out there is also how or employing those can, can also achieve that same reality that was enjoyed in that. So we have chapter 2, verses 15 and 15 through 17. And then we jump to chapter 3, and we have verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the, in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the ser serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. The serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves." Oh, I'm not sure what I want to do with this or how much I wish to speak of this particular passage. Um, I know I was challenged a long time in the past about reconciling a God that would want to keep us ignorant. In other words, why would God create a tree within the garden and then say, now don't eat of it? Um, and the serpent in some ways represents that very line of questioning. Why would God put something here uh, if only just to keep one um, not to be like God. Um, and as happens in the story, so the tree has this good-looking fruit, and what does the fruit do? The fruit ends up being, uh, well, in violation. It, it is, so God has said, look, I'm giving you everything. All I ask is that you don't do this one thing. What this shows is the arrogance of humankind to be willing to to do that one thing that God has said, please just don't do that. The other thing it makes me think of, though, is we can, I'm going to globalize this a little bit into food. We can think of lots of foods that we know are not good for us, and they may look good, and they may even taste good, but we know that um, partaking of them have um, consequences, health consequences. So when I look at this remark that um, if you eat of it, you will die, it makes me think of these things that are um, unhealthy when we indulge in them. And does this represent, again, human arrogance to indulge and overindulge to such a degree that it shows a, uh, a departure from following God's ways and leaning towards thinking that we know better than God. And to follow up on that, it also uh, kind of has there, when we get to the place where they realize they were naked, um, a sense that uh, 
the, the peace and harmony which had been enjoyed is disrupted by this same arrogance, creating then a need to cover up or cover over what God had made perfect in and of itself. Now only imperfections are seen, perhaps part of the effect of the food itself. Um, and I hate to overplay the health side of this, but um, were the results of eating the fruit, did it, it, it make them carry more weight perhaps or something of that nature, which made them more physically embarrassed about their status and therefore wanting to cover it up rather than, I don't want to say show it off because that's arrogance in a different way, um, but rather than not being aware that it was something to be embarrassed by or about at all. Um, which human bodies are a funny thing and we are funny about our bodies. And um, yeah, so as I said, I don't know how much I really want to delve into the depths of this. Um, it's a juicy passage and there has been volumes and volumes written on it. As I said, it's a typology or it's a mythology to help us understand why evil or bad exists in the world and that it has this starting point or this entry point in which it uh, unfolds because of human arrogance in a sense that uh, we start to rely more on ourselves than on God or that we know better or that we seek to be like God. And because of that arrogance, so our relationship with God begins to fracture, begins to fall apart. And so the paradise and part of the, and the peace of the paradise is lost as a result of that very, very basic uh, entry into this passage. Go back and read it a number of times. You can look online and find all sorts of interpretations. Um, as we're looking at Lent, so let's put this in the context of the liturgical calendar. Why would we have this passage? Because Lent is a time in which we wrestle with our sin, our own arrogance, and how we have not abided by God's words and God's ways. Uh, and so encountering Genesis shows us that we're in some ways not unique, that this goes back to the very foundations of, of humankind and our creation. And um, within that, the important piece is to turn back towards God. So what we see in Adam and Eve is a hiding from God, an embarrassment. And Lent calls us to stop hiding and to start facing that truth, but to understand or see or know this is not unique in and of ourselves, but is something that humanity has been wrestling with since the very beginning. And the only way out of that is to turn towards God, to repent. So we are going to move now to Romans, Paul's letter to the, to the Christians in Rome. This is chapter 5, verses 12 through 19. He writes to them, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely ha have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. 
this plays out that typology of, of using Adam as sort of the archetype for sin or trespassing or um, moving away from God and Jesus as the response or the counter to that. This was a, a popular um, typology that Paul liked to employ in his epistles to basically compare uh, Adam versus Christ, or it's called the Adam-Christ typology. So Adam representing um, violating God's will and words and ways, Christ representing following and how sort of we all are in that place of, of Adam or, or all fall under sin as a result of that, but all also can be saved as a result of Christ. So it sets up this comparison and this balance between the two and it's trying to set forth for Paul the justification of faith. Your faith is what is going to provide life. So if Adam represents sin and death, Christ represents forgiveness and life. And so these are the kind of comparisons that are going on, which gets clumsy in our translation and even clumsier trying to read it out loud. Um, and so I pray you're going to go back and read through this a number of times to really be able to appreciate it. But, you know, it talks about death from Adam to Moses, transgression from Adam, uh, but the free gift, the grace through Christ. So we, we keep having that trespass in Adam, forgiveness in Christ, um, judgment from Adam, uh, the free gift or righteousness from Christ. So we keep having these different comparisons that go on and I would encourage you, you know, maybe even make a list if you can pull this scripture up. And this is Romans 5, 12 through 19 and make a list and, and put Adam on one side and Christ on the other and see the words that Paul uses relative to Adam and then see the words that Paul employs uh, relative to, to Jesus. And you can see sort of how Jesus is the answer to all of these things associated with Adam. Now, does that mean that Paul is writing that they are attached to Adam, well, it's more like saying we are Adam's race. So we are all of this, made of the same stuff as Adam. So maybe not literally we are Adam or by a result of Adam, we are Adam, but sort of saying we're composed of the same stuff, the same earth, the same dirt, the same reality as Adam, and therefore we have all of these things within us um, and make the same mistakes and poor choices that Adam did, and only by the free gift, which is repeated throughout this passage, only by the free gift in the grace of God in Jesus Christ, do we have these things to answer all of those things which put us in the same place as Adam. Our final passage, as I highlighted at the beginning of this, is the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. This is coming to us from the Gospel of Matthew. This is in the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again is it written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. There's a lot of speculation over the amount of time that Jesus may have spent in the wilderness. And some of this has to just understand sort of the biography of Jesus is um, Joseph doesn't appear to be part of Jesus's life. So the, the assumption is that Joseph died some sometime in his adolescence. Jesus says the oldest of the children in that household would have been then responsible for maintaining the income, maintaining the house in Joseph's absence until his siblings, his brother particularly, 
reached a certain age, at which point Jesus then would have been afforded the flexibility to make his own spiritual journey, to go, go off on his own. Um, you can think of this in a lot of modern contexts, to take his leap year, to go on a religious pilgrimage, to go find himself, um, to go to college. That's not really what he did. There's speculation about the communities that Jesus may have encountered during this time, such as being part of the Essenine community, otherwise known as the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, how far east he may have gone, um, and a lot of other things. And whether this is what really comprises the wilderness experience written of in the gospel. So we're not talking about 40 explicit days, but rather experiences in which Jesus, through his own travels, encountered many different communities before he comes out of this uh, wandering to accept his own public ministry. It could have just been 40 specific days. Uh, fasting certainly was a regular part of religious life at that time, and so is not a surprise to have it incorporated into the life of Jesus. And certainly as a part of deprivation of any sort, there is a possibility of experiencing significant hunger, um, visions that one has, uh, and the, the struggle of a choice to end whatever deprivation it is that you're experiencing. So I often like to or envision thinking of this experience of Jesus in the wilderness as, as cartoons often did, with an angel on one shoulder and the devil or evil on the other shoulder. And that as Jesus is reaching the conclusion of this time in the wilderness, whatever that comprised of, and is, is facing choice, we have these three choices laid down, and one is about meeting physical needs. One is about um, uh, meeting a, a need or, or stature, a position uh, in, in society itself. And, and one is idolatrous. It's positioning oneself even as a god or um, parallel to God. So we have sort of three different temptations appealing to three different pieces of our human persona. We might say the heart, uh, the stomach, the heart, and the head. Um, and so each one is unique to see if all of those are in coordination. If, if um, despite whatever hungers or appetites are there uh, for personal achievement, uh, for physical satisfaction, that the motivations are rightly placed. And so we begin with food and the stones in the sense that the power is there to um, eliminate the hunger that is existing and to, to uh, meet that need with bread is, is the form of this temptation itself. The second one has to do um, with uh, power and this is um, taking him up to the pinnacle of the temple and, and saying, you can throw yourself down and, and God will, will not allow you to be hurt or harmed. And uh, this too is, is answered or responded to. And the, the last one is basically equaling that of God. Maybe we can put arrogance um, as the second one and the final one is idolatry. Um, but three different forms of three different uh, temptations, as I said, stomach, heart, and, and head, or maybe it's stomach, head, and heart. Um, and uh, each of these are answered with scripture. And I think what's interesting about that is following the first temptation we have, one does not live by bread, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Scripture is considered the inspired word of God. And for Jesus, the Jewish scripture also was considered the same thing. And so using scripture to answer the temptations that were being experienced is a reference of the placement of God and God's ways first and foremost before even physical hunger is met that does this align with God and God's purposes for me and for the world? Is God first in my life uh, before I will even consider? So we have um, 
Jesus answering, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the third answer, uh, worship the Lord your God, serve only him. So don't put your God to the test, worship only God. And um, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. This every word that comes from God becomes the baseline of Jesus' response to all the other temptations. Now, obviously, the, the easiest coordination, as I said at the beginning of why this is used at Lent, is we're entering a season in the wilderness ourselves. And, and we will be tempted, uh, specifically if we are giving up or taking on something, to not maintain our discipline if it's something very challenging to us. But there are also other temptations that basically turn us away from God or toward which we can follow which are not of God. And so encountering these temptations of Jesus help us to understand that Jesus faced the same things that we face. Uh, he faced them in this extreme example as we face them in daily ways, and Jesus will face them daily himself. But in all of these, we find a thorough response to them. And so this is a way for us to also turn ourselves towards God, to repent, and to afford our ability to immerse ourselves in God's word, and by doing so, to have responses at the ready when the temptations come so that we're capable of refusing them and refuting them. So a little primer on this first week of Lent. Um, I really do encourage you to go back to these scriptures and explore them more deeply as we approach Sunday morning. As I noted, we will be using the lectionary through this season. So I know many of you have other devotions, devotional um books and things that you do that coordinate with the lectionary. So that'll be great because that'll help you to uh, hear these scriptures through those as well. Um, I look forward to this journey with you and, uh, and as I hope you will hold me to accountability through the season of Lent, know that I'm also here to hold you up and to keep you turning towards God in this season of Lent. God bless you, and we'll see you next week for Exploring Sunday's Scriptures.